Hello my friends and welcome back to our Blind Let's Play over 17, the Art of Infinity for the PC. My name is Flutterzboro, this is Story Biscuit Channel, and today we're going to continue and unravel the past, shall we? During the day, Sugumi worked for next to nothing at a sewing factory while the baby stayed at a daycare center. She spent every day glued to a sewing machine from early morning to 4pm, and after that she would spend time with the babies. Her wages were very low, so of course they were poor. She couldn't even afford disposable diapers. Sugumi collected small scraps of cloth, leftovers from the factory, and sewed diapers and clothes for the babies. Despite the harsh living conditions, the babies were growing healthily. The life was a peaceful one, and although they were poor, the poverty didn't threaten them. They were content. The three of them were always smiling. Mama! Mama! Oh, Chami! Chami! They were already beginning to talk. The boy had started walking a few steps at a time. The girl was able to stand, barely, as she held on to things. The girl had begun to speak. Oh, Chami, Chami, which was very unusual for a one-year-old. The boy seemed grew faster physically and the girl grew faster intellectually. Sugumi tenderly watched over the cute gestures. She was filled with happiness. May 7th, 2019. The two babies were 15 months old. Sugumi had taken them to the beach. The boy ran around the sand, falling and getting back up over and over. The girl was sitting by the water, putting her hands in the waves. She was giggling, saying, cold, so cold. Watching out over the flat surface of the ocean, Sugumi's thoughts turned to Takashi. So live. As long as you're alive, live. Don't worry, I'm not going to die. Those were Takeshi's last words to her. It had been two years already. I'm not going to die. And after saying that, he sank to the bottom of the ocean protecting the woman he loved, protecting the children right in front of her. You fool, you're a liar, Sugumi whispered to the ocean. But at the same time, she still hadn't given up hope. No, he must be alive somewhere. He's a man of his word. Just then, a wave swallowed the girl who had been playing near the edge of the water. It was a small, sun-soaked wave from an adult's perspective. But for a one-year-old child, it was a raging wall of water. The girl disappeared in a splash of water and was sucked out into the ocean like a piece of driftwood by the tide. Sugumi ran as hard as she could, held back by the resistance of the sand. But before she could get there, something unbelievable happened. The boy, who was only one year and three months old, jumped into the water and saved the girl. Hardly able to believe what she had seen, Sugumi rushed toward them. She carried them to dry sand. The girl started crying. The boy, seemingly unaware of what had happened, looked at his, sis at his crying sister. A few seconds later, he fell over as if all the strength had left him. That night, both of them came down with a high fever. It was summertime. A year and a half had passed since the birth. All that time in the previous year and a half had been filled with happiness. Nothing special had happened, and that was why it had been so peaceful. The boy was a wild one, and Sugumi could hardly take her eyes off of him for a second. Oh look. I can't get a um I can't get a full picture here, but it's it's a really cute picture. He was constantly putting everything, even Chami, in his mouth. Any electrical pines that he touched seemed to break, and he wanted to stop jamming metal wires into the outlets. The girl wasn't quite as much of a challenge, since she was moved since she moved about less, but still Sugumi had to put up with her stubbornness. She refused to eat things she didn't like, and when she got in a bad mood, she wouldn't stop fussing. And no matter how much Sugumi warned her, she wouldn't stop playing with her brother's hair. And she would always demand, more chammy, more chammy. Those days were filled with Sugumi being buffeted about by her two rambunctious children. 
But no matter how challenging they were, even those days were filled with happiness. At night, all three of them slept together, cradled, cuddled up on a thin mattress. Mama. Mama. Ah, Chammy, Chammy! Talking in their sleep, the two babies sought their mother's touch. Looking down at their sweet, innocent gestures, Sugumi felt bliss she had never known. One day, her peaceful world was shattered to pieces. It all happened so unexpectedly. Caught up in a life of happiness, Sugumi had forgotten to watch out for them. She didn't know how they had found out, but they had somehow gathered information and showed up without warning. Them, the people from Leblick. With no time to collect anything, all Sugumi could bring with her was her two babies and her hamster as she fled. So they ran, but it was obvious to Sugumi that eventually Leblick would hunt them down. As they continued running, Sugumi thought to herself, Even if I could escape, keep escaping, would it really be happiness for the two children? They wouldn't be able to go to school, and it would be too hard on them to keep moving from town to town. Besides, if we ever get caught, what would they do to my children at Leblec? It's too dangerous for them to be with me. Sugumi made up her mind. She researched an orphanage she could trust and decided to leave them there. The two children were just too young. Even if Sugumi had tried to explain, they couldn't have understood. With no other option, she left the pendant she had kept with her, making a wish as she gave it. I will come back for you. I will come get I will come to get you, I promise. Being too young to understand the situation, the two children just stared at the mother crying. Weeping bitter tears, Sugumi looked back many times as she walked away. All she had left was Chami. From Sugumi's chest pocket, Chami looked up at her face in puzzlement. But even Chami's cute gestures could do little to ease Sugumi's broken heart. She spent many nights in the depths of despair, crying in her sorrow. Oh god, this is hard to read! A few years later, by the time Sugumi went back to the orphanage, the children were already gone. From that time on, she had gone through life, no more than an empty husk. Until that day, until that very moment, Sugumi had kept searching for her children, wandering through darkness. Sugumi finished telling her story and closed her eyes gently. She never once mentioned the names Okto or Sarah in the story, because those names weren't the names Sugumi had given them. Someone else had named them Hokuto and Sarah. All the dots. I love Sugumi and Sarah. If I could, I wanted to stay with them forever, but it wasn't possible. There were still many unsolved mysteries that I need to take care of. Yes, there are. Listening to Sugumi's story had caused me to suddenly remember something. I had received a phone call before coming to Lemieux. Over the phone, a voice had said to me, if you come to Lemieux, you can see your mother and sister. Oh, so that was it. Before the accident took place, I had been waiting for someone at the rest area. It must have been my mother and Sarah. Sugumi must have been roped into coming to Lemieux the same way I was. Wait, roped in? What for? I still didn't know the answer to that, but I had some clues. The voice on the phone had been male. Without doubt, I knew whose voice it had been. I ran to him. You, you, yeah, who is? Fake Takeshi. You aren't Kirinari Takeshi. Barging into the rest area, I demanded an answer from the man in front of me. I couldn't call him Takeshi anymore. That guy had been deceiving us the whole time. Hey, look, I don't have any clue what you're talking about. Don't play dumb. I know that the real Takeshi is Sarah's and my father. Uh, father? Me? You and Sarah's? No, not you. Sarah and I are the children of Takeshi and Tsugumi. Uh, wait, so Tsugumi and I, uh... I keep telling you, you're not Takeshi! I'm talking about Takeshi from the other world. Uh, the world, uh, what the heck is that supposed to mean? The world back in 2017. Mm -hmm. 2017 ne. Um, uh, 
2017, huh? And uh, when were you born? On January 21st, 16 years ago. Uh, in what year? I was born in 2018. Uh, I see. So, uh, how could you possibly know what happened in 2017? I, I don't know, I just do. What do you expect me to do about it? Oh, the dots. Besides, we're not talking about me now. Who, who are you, anyway? And why did you lie about the year 2017? Why are you pretending to be Kuranori Takashi? What was the reason you tried to trick us by repeating the same incident as 17 years ago and by using the same words? Damasu. Damasu ne. Hey, to trick you. To trick you, huh? Shonen. Yoku kangaite miro yo. Eh, think twice, will you, kid? Uh, for instance, if I was repeating the incident in 2017, uh, how could I possibly trick you, someone who was born in 2018? Uh, practically speaking, it's impossible to trick you into believing the same incident from 17 years ago is taking place. Uh, do you get it? Oh, the frustrated thoughts. Besides, how could you tell it was the same incident? How could you tell that I'm using the same phrase? How could you know the history before you were even born? Uh, why don't you reveal your true self? Who are you anyway? For some reason, I couldn't say a word. Who am I, anyway? The same question was repeated in my mind. Oh, I see. Uh, so when it comes to your story, you claim up, huh? Alright then. I'll uh, tell you my real name. Uh, yes, as you said, I am not Kirinari Takeshi. My real name is Kaburaki. Kaburaki. Kaburaki Ryogo. Kaburaki Ryogo. Kaburaki Ryogo. Kaburaki Ryogo. Kaburaki Ryogo. I just remembered my name. Wait, what? The kid repeated slowly. So he's the same person as Takeshi in the future, but how is he the same person? Uh, Kabaraki Ryugu. I see. Now, this is getting really confusing because now my voices are all out of whack because who I thought was Takeshi is not Takeshi and who I thought was Kid is not Kid, so now my voices don't make any sense at all! Oh well. I'm just gonna stick with it. I mean, we're 50 plus parts in. You might as well. Uh, I see. Uh, way to go. I smiled and patted his head. Uh, the young Kabara... Kabaraki smiled shyly. Without a word, the young Kabaraki went behind the statue and started scratching. He had a screwdriver in his hand. Kabaraki Vyogo. With thin, sharp writing, the young Kabaraki carved his name deeply into the statue. He must have been pretty happy to have remembered his name. Uh, or was it so that he wouldn't forget it again? Although I didn't know the reason, he carved his name into the statue. He continued on. Without stopping his hand, he also carved some more names. Yagami Koko, Tanaka Yube Se Harukana, Kamachi Sugumi, Akane Kasaki Sora, Kiranari Takeshi, Pippi and Chemi. And by the way, why is it that Sora never told us the truth about what was going on? The young Kabaraki carved the names of everyone who had been confined there. He smiled happily after finishing up. The statue kept silent with his hand on his chest. The boy's name was also Kabaraki Ryogo? 
which meant that the kid from 17 years ago and the guy pretending to be Takeshi were actually the same person? He looks so young now, it was hard to believe it had been 17 years. If the young Kabaraki was 15 years old, that would make him 32 years old in my world. But the Kabaraki I spoke to looked around 20. There was no way he could have been over 30 years old unless he had the Curie virus. Which meant all the dots. Before I realized it, the man who called himself Kabaraki had disappeared. He had left a while before. I'd been standing there, lost in thought for some time. I recall this scene in 2017, which I had just witnessed earlier. I went around one of the statues as it being called over to it. On the back were carved childish stick figures. Six human-like figures and two unfamiliar animal shapes were drawn there. What? I looked at the statue. The statue pointed south. Huh? I looked at the back of the other statues as well. Surprisingly, there were similar drawings on the statue pointing to the sky. There were also six people's names as well as Pepe and Chami carved onto the statue which stood with its hand on its chest. There was no writing on the statue pointing east. Oh, just what is this supposed to mean? What's up with this world anyway? Puzzled and totally confused, my head felt like it was about to explode. I didn't know things I was supposed to know, and I knew things that I wasn't supposed to know. That must be why my head is so confused. I still haven't recalled any of my memories. Some parts of it had come back, but nothing really important. To begin with, I still didn't know what kind of person Hokuto was. And at the same time, I knew what I wasn't supposed to know, and I could see what I wasn't supposed to see. For instance, the world 17 years into the past, about the legend of Pygmalion, the Teep Blow virus, the Curie virus, Pepe, and Chami. I knew about all of them. I knew exactly what had happened during the dramatic escape 17 years ago and what had happened on May 6th and 7th. And the world in 2034. I could sense even the different history flows in my world. I knew about escaping using the principle of a siphon and about swimming to the ocean surface from 34 meters under the water. The third eye, blick winkle, those words were clear in my head. And then, I remembered running into Dr. Tanaka on the floating island. No, rather than remembering, it was better to say that I could see it. Anyway, I saw her. The woman who was called Dr. Tanaka, Yubi Sei Akikana's mother. Meaning she was actually... Yubisei Harukana. Although the relationship divided the norm, Yubisei Harukana and Yubisei Akikana were still mother and daughter. All the dots. Pieces of my thoughts scattered. I tried gathering them and struggled to come up with some kind of conclusion. It's 2034 now, and Coco was in 2017. I whispered to confirm the facts. Yes, that was right, it was 2034. That was why Sukumi had been so suspicious of us. Because the same thing that had happened 17 years ago was repeating. How about the others? Since Yubisei Akikana had been born 17 years prior, she could have possibly have known about the incident. And since Sara hadn't been born yet, she wouldn't know either. Sora, being AI, couldn't lie and she didn't seem to be lying either. So that left only Ku Kaba Kabaraki. Did that mean that Kabaraki was the mastermind behind the whole incident in 2034? No, wait. There had been two others who had survived the incident 17 years ago. Yubisei Harukana and Koko. On May 6, 2017, Kabaraki, Yubisei Harukana, and Koko, who had been infected with the t virus, had been rescued by the mini-sub which came to the pool in IBF. Hey, that reminds me. How did the three of them recover from the virus after they'd been infected? Because the injection of antibodies made from Sagumi's blood? But Coco hadn't received the antibodies, because she had been under high pressure oxygen treatment in the capsule pod at the time. Huh? No, no, even before that. Yubisei Harukana suffered from critical heart disease, right? But she was still alive and well. What is going on here? There was only one answer. It was the only explanation. Yubisei Harukana and Kabaraki must have been infected with the Curie virus. The bodies must have repeated five years worth of cell division and when all their DNA had been rewritten, they stopped aging. That must have been why they looked younger than their real age. And Yubisei Harakana's heart disease would have been fixed by the Curie virus. 
but still, is that really what happened? In a different history flow, Kaburaki couldn't see the image in the pendant. If he wasn't lying or acting, he must not have possessed infrared vision. And although I don't have proof, my instincts told me you would say Harukana did possess infrared vision either. Then again, in the world of 2017, Sugumi had mentioned she was special among carriers of the Kure virus. Perhaps she was a rare example of DNA replacement that had taken place safely over the whole body. Well that meant, Yubise Harukana and Kabaraki weren't completely cure, but it didn't seem to me that there could be any such thing as an incomplete cure. Um, it's no use. I can't figure it out. But I still had far more serious and pressing matters to deal with. I needed to think about that problem first. The problem was, how was I able to sense instance that had taken place before I was born or in separate time continuia? And, why is the same accident as 17 years earlier taking place again? It couldn't have been a coincidence. No, it couldn't have been. Obviously, someone had planned it. It was probably either to save Coco or Takeshi. That's what I'm guessing. In a similar way that, you know, the, the Zero Escape series started out, right? There was only one clue. Coco. I want to see Coco. I felt that Coco would know everything there was to know about the incident. But how could I find Coco who seemed to just pop up randomly? Oh, I know. I had a sudden inspiration. I had a hunch. And at that hour on the 5th, Coco would show up. In the Cosmic Whale Room. Hey, hey, Wilson. Wilson. Uh, what time is it? Uh, a whale of a time? Uh, you. You better not have asked me to come all this way just tell me that stupid joke. And it's only 8 a.m. in the morning. No. Uh, I just wanted to go on a date with you and... Uh, to date? Yeah. Uh, well, Takapion, you like me, right? Uh, so that means we're going out. Uh, uh, when a boyfriend and girlfriend tell each other their true feelings, everyone knows it's best to be under a starlit sky. Uh, that's why I brought you here, to whale son. Oh, the duds. Uh, actually, I'm just teasing you. Huh? Uh, you're already married, right, Takapion? Uh huh. Don't be shy. Uh, I, I know everything there is to know about you. And not only just you, I know everything there is to know about everything. Uh, everything you say? Well, yeah. Uh, of course, I'm a psychic. Oh, the dirts. Uh, for as long as I can remember, I've been able to talk with people from different worlds. Uh, different worlds meaning uh, the other side? Uh, no, not like that. Just another world that isn't this one. Oh, uh. Uh, if I borrow the sight from the people in the other world, I can see everything from the past and future. Oh, really? Uh, well. Uh, like the people in the second dimension, they can't really see the whole world, right? Huh? Uh, you can't see those huge line drawings at Nazca, Peru from the ground, right? And, 
Okay, and let's say you have a really cool drawing of a robot on your computer display. One of the dots on the screen, they can't see the whole drawing. Uh, yeah? Uh, so what can they do to see the whole picture? Uh, well, for the pictures at Nazca, all you have to do is go up in the air and look down. And, and for the picture on the display, if you can get a little bit away from the pic from the screen into the third dimension, you can see it, right? Oh, the dots. Uh, we're in the third dimension, right? Only the third dimension keeps moving on forward in time. So, in order to see it moving, you can't just stay in the third dimension. You'd have to look down at everything from the fourth dimension. Come to think of it, didn't Sora mention something like this? Uh, but I'm human and I can't get out of the floor of time. So I just borrowed the viewpoint of the people from the fourth dimension. Uh, then what you're trying to say is that people from the other side are really people from the fourth dimension? Mm. Yep. Well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever... Well, I can. I really can. Oh, the dots. I really, really can. Great, huh? It's the third eye. Yeah, you could call it that too. Then you can tell everything about my past. Um, well, I don't really think I can help you, Hoktan. Huh? Uh, because you aren't really Hoktan, right? All the dots? Hoktan so, you aren't buying anyone's perspective, I, I think. In, in your case, Hoktan, I'm pretty sure you're just perspective itself, right? What do you mean? Like Winkle-san. What? Uh, I'm pretty sure Blick Winkle-san knows everything. Blick Winkle. Just then. Cuck, 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 boom! A massive boom rocked our eardrums. We all reflexively looked up. The ceiling of our world, the cosmos, had shattered. Immediately, a large amount of seawater rained down on us like an avalanche. Shards from the shattered wall cracked off and shot into the floor like bullets. I looked back, but Coco was gone. Coco! Nobody was there to respond. All this sound was drowned out from the water rushing in, such that we could hardly ever hear our own voices. Droplets of water were falling from above, white mist was rising from below. The water level was rising quickly. An incoming jet of water from the ceiling struck the whale, which was suspended in the center of the room. It bent backward, hard, fall, fell, and lay on the floor. Its big mouth flapped open, its pupils empty. The whale was dead. I turned around, cutting through the water, and fled from the room. The door to the Cossack whale room closed with a gurgling sound. Uh, Oni-chan, are you okay? I spun around, drawn by Sarah's voice. She was standing there, shoulders heaving. I ran here as soon as the alarm sounded, but... Looking over Sarah's shoulder, I could see people running toward us from the corridor. I returned my gaze to the door. It didn't appear to be leaking. The cosmic whale room was flooded, but it looked as though the other areas were safe for the time being. Hey, Oni-chan. Huh? Blood. Huh? You're bleeding. Sarah pointed to my left hand. I looked at my palm. Where had I gotten a cut? Had a shard slashed me when it fell, and I just hadn't noticed? 
Or had I snagged at something when I was trying to get out of the door? At any rate, bright red blood was dripping from the side of my hand. Thank you. You okay? Sarah took a wet handkerchief from her pocket and looked and took my injured hand in hers, binding the wound. Does it hurt? I shook my head. The truth was, I didn't feel anything. More important than the scratch on my hand. Blick Winkle. Eh? Sarah tilted her head questioningly. More than the injury, more than the flooding, more than anything, Coco's words were running through my head. Blickwinkle. Blickwinkle. Who are you? Who am I? Again. I could hear that voice again. Was it my voice or someone else's? I kept staring at the palm of my left hand. A red stain spread slowly across the white fabric. Who are you? Who am I? Because you aren't really Hokutan, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure Blick Winkle san knows everything. Blick Winkle. Blick Winkle. Blood. The wet crimson stain spread, and blood fell in thick droplets. Landing in the puddles at my feet. It spread out in the water like smoke to eventually dissolve into the seawater. Just then, my vision grew red. May 6th, Saturday. Two days away. I could see it. I could see everything. Everything in the year 2017. And I don't mean two days away, I mean one day away, right? Because May 7th is when everything goes down. A continuous flow of fragmentary images. Pieces of the world flowed by without context. It was simply an onlooker of everything in the world. Yes, I couldn't take part. I could only watch. I was nothing more than a perspective. <coughs> so here's where Coco was coughing up blood. This is when they decided to go to Hamel. <coughs> Coco groaned and pressed her hand against her mouth. Fresh crimson blood dribbled through the cracks of her fingers. A red stain spread on the floor of the control room. This is bad. These, these symptoms are... Symptoms? Who cares about symptoms? Can't you tell? If this keeps up, Coco's going to... Uh, Coco, hang in there. God, that, that, that threw me off because I see his name Kabaraki and so Takashi. Kuranari, what are we going to do? Wait. I forgot. Kabaraki is kid, not Takashi. Oh man, this is messing my brain. Uh, wait, don't panic. Everyone just calm down. I was only a perspective and had no real sense of feeling. The link between my sight and consciousness had been broken, and all I could do was continually gaze at the scene unfolding before me. I felt neither sadness nor anger, neither impatience nor despair. I was looking at the reality in front of me as one might stare at a meaningless jumble of numbers. Teep Blow, 2017, Revision 17 the LMRI was scanning Coco's condition. The teeth blow virus. Coco, hold on. No, don't you die on me. Coco's body lay on the examination table. What if, what if, what if Kid or Kabaraki, what if Kabaraki is doing this to try to bring back Coco because he loved Coco so much? Kabaraki held her thin arm intensely. Open your eyes, Coco. Please, wake up. The kid grabbed hold of Coco's shoulders and shook her violently. Hey, cut it out. Stop it, kid. Is it me or does Takeshi look different? Takeshi looks very different. Absolutely. In my fact, he kind of looks the same like Sugumi does. 
Takeshi pulled him back from Poco. So this is this must be what Takeshi really looks like. And that's why Takeshi had blonde hair in the future. Because Kid had blonde hair. Huh. Uh, what are you doing? Eh, hey, calm down. Now, what do you think that's going to accomplish, huh? But Coco's gonna, she's gonna. If we don't do anything, Coco's going to die. Eh, hey, calm down. There's gotta be something we can do. Don't get crazy. Let's just calm down and think. Sora interrupted Takeshi and the kid with her hand. Looking all the people gathered in the face, she announced, There is an installation called ABF directly below us. The management company that built Lemieux is Liberlic Pharmaceuticals. Their research facility is IBF. IBF? Hey, IBF? Takeshi mumbled to himself. It seemed as if it were as familiar to him. There is a medical center there that is far superior to this one. At least from the information I can get from the Miss database. It appears that they have a new type of high pressure oxygen treatment device there. And if we can treat her with that, her leukocyte or white blood cell activity should increase. That should ease Coco Chan's condition somewhat. Yes, Alright then. EBF. EBF. So all we need to do is to get her there and Coco can be saved, right? Demo EBF Nikuniwa Himmel Tora Naito. Himmel no Tobira wa Hiraka na this yo. However, in order to get to ABF, we have to get through Himmel, and Himmel's door isn't opening. I don't care, we're going. There isn't any other way there. It might not work. But we don't know that unless we try, right? Sora, show me how to get there. All the dots. Hey, kid, give me a hand. Oh, okay. Takeshi picked up Coco's inter inner body and carried her piggyback. They arrived at Himmel. The door was shut fast. Ah, uh, dang it, what are we going to do? All the dots. All the dots. Lots of dots. And a whine. Coco slid off of Takeshi's back. She weakly hunched over on the floor. The color of her face had gone translucent white, her lips parched, and her eyes looked feverish. Just then. Okay, I don't know what that means. Uh, what's that announcement? Someone is trying to access the Mii system. From inside the room, from a terminal inside Himmel. Uh, what? The access indicator light for electronic lock began to blink green and soon changed to green. The hatch's lever raised and turned automatically. The door opened. It was pure white inside. Squinting against the brightness, they walked into the room to explore. It appeared as if it was the computer control room. Uh, hey, there's someone here. Uh, did you open up the door just now? There was someone passed out on the floor. He was a man who appeared to be in his 40s, dressed in a white lab coat. Hey, uh, buddy, are you alright? Takeshi rushed over to the man and lifted him into a sitting position. All the dots. The man didn't reply to Takeshi's call. He just sat there with his eyes closed. Hey, who is this guy? Uh, Sora, do you have any idea who this is? 
No, I am unable to verify his ID. But judging from the way he is dressed, it is safe to assume he was a researcher at the IBF facility. The researcher let out a dry gasp and opened his eyes slightly. Uh, hey, are you one of the staff from the research facility? Uh, uh, yeah, well, that's right. It doesn't seem like you're here to rescue me. With a shaking hand, he grabbed onto Takeshi. The hand was covered in blood. So there were still people in the Mew, and it's been six days since. <laughs> uh, what a surprise. Blood trickled from his mouth, and he smiled wryly. Uh, hey, don't strain yourself. You know how to talk. I'm so sorry. It's all our fault. Eh, what happened? Did something happen down there? Everyone stood quietly, gathered around the researcher, and seemed to have lost the ability to talk. The research worker murmured and looked up vacantly at all the figures around him. Uh, but why all this? This. After that, he was silent. His eyelids slowly closed. Hey, hey, hang in there! Takeshi shook the man's shoulders. There was no response, but at least it seemed he was breathing. Well, we'll have to bring him with us. Takeshi nodded and stood up, then picked up the unconscious researcher. Watching the situation, Sora began a quiet explanation. Everyone, at the far end of this room is another room. Can you see it? That is a compression chamber for IBF. Judging from my incomplete data, IBF I'm sorry, you kept starting and stopping. My bad. I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. IBF is a closed and higher pressure gas than the Mew. The IBF area is set to what is known as saturated diving specifications. This type of area is also probably more suitable for research with bacteria. The atmospheric pressurization of IBF is actually at about 12.5 atmospheres. I want all of you to enter that room. And after you spend about one hour in the compression chamber, you'll take the access elevator down to IPF. And I should tell you this as a precaution. You will... You will not be able to retrace your steps easily from this point on. Please give this due consideration. Following Sora's instructions, everyone headed into the IBF compression chamber. The long compression started. During that time, nobody said a single word. The compression finished. Everyone got aboard the lift. The door sealed and the elevator started to lower as though it was sliding. The door opened and everyone poured out. It seemed that there was a pool where a small submarine could dock. Although the area was directly attached to the ocean, the inside and outside pressure were the same, keeping the ocean water out of the room. It was the same as turning a cup inside upside down and putting it on water. They all stopped in their tracks and studied the surroundings intensely, as if waiting for an alarm to go off. There was no sign of anyone. Well anyway, let's get to where we have to go. 
They opened a watertight door at the other side of the room and continued deeper into the installation. The examination room. The kid and you placed Coco, who they'd been carrying, on a nearby bed. Sugumi and Takeshi slowly lowered the researcher down into a chair. An LMRI, the same type that had been in the Muse Infirmary, was in the room. Nah, you. Now just seeing Takeshi like this is very, you know, very interesting. Um, why does he look different though? Was that just a trick that the game played on us early on? Because he definitely looks very different now. Or am I just mistaken on that? I'm pretty sure he always had, like, blonde hair, right? Uh, hey you, where's that high pressure oxygen thing that Sue was talking about? Uh, how should I know? Tsugumi, how should I know? Tsugumi, what should we do? I mean, look at them. Uh, their hair looks exactly the same. Their eyes, well, okay, their eyes don't look the same. But their hair looks exactly the same now. Well, we'll have to look for it. None of us know a thing about this place. <coughs> Ma Wait. The researcher coughed as he spoke. Uh, hey, uh, don't move. Are you okay? I've been better, but at least I'm alive. The researcher raised his hand weakly as he spoke. The smell. Is this IBF? <laughs> so I'm back where I started. <coughs> Uh, so you were working here? Well then, there's something I want to ask you. We're looking for some kind of high pressure oxygen treatment device. Yeah, we've come as far as the examination room, but we don't have a clue what to look for. Can you help us, please? Oxygen treatment, yeah. You're looking for the parts. There should be some alloy capsules with mats set inside of them. They look like a bunch of cylinders stuck to a pillar. Do you see them? Ah, uh, Yeah, they, they're right in front of me. <laughs> well, that's them. <laughs> well, uh, hang in there. We found them, so don't waste your energy talking anymore, okay? New blood appeared on the researcher's closed hand as he wiped his mouth. Just take a look at the manual. They should be easy to operate. Ah, Okay, I gotcha. The strength left the researcher's hand. As he sat there, it seemed that all the life had left the researcher's body and he looked like an old withered up tree. Well, let's get Coco into a pod and this researcher too. Yeah. They put Coco and the researcher into separate pods and closed the lids. Uh, did you find the manual? Yeah, this is the control panel. Flipping through a thick book that appeared to be the manual, you started operating a, therm a terminal a short distance away. High pressure oxygen treatment, set. The screens of the monitors attached to the tubes flickered. Both of the pods seemed to be functioning normally. Well, that should do it. Okay. Okay. Blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, normal. They silently watched Coco and the researcher. Although it was too soon to say if they had recovered, Coco and the researcher's face seemed to settle a bit. They had somehow managed to stave off death. I'm so relieved. Yeah, 
Tell me about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it looks like a minute in time. Everyone let out a sigh of relief. It seemed as if they had escaped the worst for the moment. Uh, Will. Uh, we don't have time to hang around, you know. They started searching around the facility. Their aim was threefold. To find a way to escape the facility, to see if any communication lines were open, and to look for any other survivors. While Takeshi Sugumi and the young Kabaraki were searching around IBF, you stayed with the rest of Koko and researched her. Meanwhile, Takeshi and the others soon arrived at a small room covered in iron plating. There were a few computer terminals there with, near, with nobody stationed at them. Operating the terminals, they scanned through some of the information there. They were searching for any information that they could use and finally came across something interesting. IBF Visitor Registry Yagami Koko. Koko's name was listed in the corner of a business log. Looking further into the file, there seemed to be a personal memo written by somebody. Author Yagami Takeshi. I get to see my daughter for the first time in a while. Her school is on vacation, so she has a 10 day break. I just noticed his name is Takeshi. Is that why Koko was calling him daddy because they had the similar name? I've been trapped for so long in this tin can doing virus research that I'm jealous. That aside, when I told her that special permission I've been granted for her to come down and see IBF, she sent me a happy reply saying she would. We've exchanged mail every once in a while, but I wonder how long it's been since we've actually seen each other. I'll just be happy if she hasn't forgotten what I look like. Which meant that Coco had visited IBF once before May 1st to meet her father. Postscript. It seems like T.Y.'s daughter is working part-time here at Lemieux. I'm still not sure if I should tell him or... After that point, all the data was corrupted, making it impossible to check what else had been written. In the end, they found nothing. No way out, no means to communicate, and no survivors. And after searching around, Takeshi, Kabaraki, and Sugumi all headed back to the examination room. You, Jokyo wa? Uh, hey you, uh, how are they doing? Ah, uh, yeah, it looks like they're doing okay for now. You looked tired as she sat down and faced the pod's control panel. Her eyes were a bit red, as if they'd been crying. Oh yeah, Kiranari, I checked the medical database on this terminal earlier, but... Well, yeah, did you find something? Yeah. It looks as if they still haven't found any definite way to treat the t virus. Although the symptoms can be temporarily treated by injecting that orange serum. Otherwise, the only option is to hope for a small chance that will clear up by itself. Oh. Well, that sucks. Huh? What do you mean? Um. Well, basically. If Coco is going to heal, her immune system is going to have to work a little harder. We brought her to the treatment pod, so all we can do now is hope. Yeah, that's all we can do. No. Coco isn't going to get better? Uh, nobody said that. Uh, whether she gets better or not, it's up to Coco's will to live. The young Kabaraki walked over to the pod where Coco was sleeping. Coco. Coco. He started to cry, latching onto the pod as though he was embracing it. We still don't know how much this pod is going to help Coco. You murmured softly as she read the life signs on the monitor. Uh, 
It seems that this pod can also do laser and disinfecting as well as simple surgery in addition to oxygen treatment. And depending on how you use it, even cryogenic suspension. Wait, is Coco still here? Is that why her ghost went to Himal? Is Coco cryogenically suspended underneath Lemieux in IBF today? Hibernation. Cryogenic suspension. Uh, what's that, you? I'm not sure, it was just in the manual. We don't really know what's going to happen. All we can do is have faith and wait. Oh, the dots. Oh, the dots. Oh, the dots. Right then. A sharp alarm sounded from the control panel monitor. Shocked, the four of them all turned to face the screen at once. An agonized expression came on the face of the researcher. He thrashed and contorted inside of the crack capsule. Huh? Ah! Uh, hey, hey, man! The researcher coughed violently and clawed at his throat. His hand and the area around his mouth were stained red. <laughs> the color quickly drained from his skin. His breathing became shallow and he groaned in a low voice. No, I can't believe his condition would change like this. Uh, hey man, stop grabbing at your throat like that, you crush it. He slowly lowered the hands which he had been thrashing his throat with. Hey man, are you alright? No. This is as far as I make it. The researcher was barely breathing. He was trying to breathe. He let out a grasp, but wasn't able to bring in air. This is my word. <laughs> you poured over the manual and desperately searched the control panel, but there was nothing she could do. There was no way for her to keep him alive. She pounded on the manual. Then she placed both her elbows on the panel and covered her face with her hands. She burst into tears. Oh, the dots. Oh, the double dots. Sugumi and Kabaraki gazed at the monitor with stained, strained expressions. The researchers' vital signs were getting weaker. My daughter. Take care of my daughter. He looked as though he was smiling. And finally he stopped breathing. The life readings of the capsule pod went blank and an electronic alarm sounded for what seemed like forever. Oh, the dots. Even Pippi has no words. Takeshi reached out his hand to the panel and turned off the alarm. Uh, how is Coco? Normal. You replied in a voice filled with tears. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong for the moment. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll have to make sure he gets a proper burial. It was an unsettling silence. In the belly of the Iron Hulk, they stopped breathing and stood still. Their expressions were lifeless. It was impossible to tell what any of them were thinking. The white interior of the room was filled with a quiet calm. Time passed slowly, cruelly, crawling forward second by second. All the dots. Takeshi and Yu leaned against the wall of the corridor. <laughs> I'm sure some kind of circumstances kept him from escaping, and circumstances that kept him alive. You finally spoke. 
Her small voice bounced off of the cold iron walls of the partitioning. Uh, circumstances? Before he died and everyone was off searching, I had the chance to talk with him some. I tried to get him to stop because he seemed like he was suffering, but... He said talking made him feel better, so... I see. Uh, well, what did he talk about? Um... Before coming to IBF, he said that he had been involved with the project to develop Lemieux's system. He was one of the staff who engineered Lemieux's management software. Uh, meaning that, uh... Himmel, Lemmy, and Sora. Everything left behind is here in the Mew. Being a programmer? The system here at the Mew was like his own child. So, uh, he was worried about his children? You know, I always thought that that was Coco's dad. Is that not Coco's dad? When he says daughter, is he talking about Sora? Yeah, that must have been it. Worrying about his children is what helped him live a while longer. She closed her eyes and let out a small sigh. And as they're shrugging off the heaviness of the moment, she bolted away from the wall and said, Oh yeah, there was one other thing I heard from him that I was able to check up on. Uh, what's that? Sora's location. So is the Sora that we know, is it in Insulna? Uh huh. We know that Lemmy's central processing unit, the main supercomputer, is on the floating island. It seems that everything that happens here in the Mew is saved in the Mew's memory storage. Uh, what? Leblik Pharmaceuticals keeps an original system programming for Akane Gasaki Sora. So, even if they lose a copy of the Mew, it won't hurt at them at all? So basically, it's possible to make many different versions of the Sora system. So, 2017, Sora's original programming was lost. Right? She was lost. And then, 17 years later, the new Sora didn't remember the previous events here because that was a different Sora. Sort of like the cloning idea, you know, the different clones created, which means one doesn't remember the other. So the so the Sora we knew in 2017 basically died. And then the Sora in 2034 isn't telling us about what happened 17 years ago because this new Sora doesn't remember what the old Sora knew because they're two different entities. And then what probably happened is the Sora that exists in 2034 that Sora exists, they, they changed the system, so now she's able to exist in other places. So the Sora in 2034 probably could be saved for 2017? Is that possible? I don't know, I'm trying to wrap my head around all this, and it's not easy. Even the Sora here might just be a copy. Like, it was a lot easier when there wasn't a 17-year time difference. When you're thinking about, okay, this was two different dimensions, it was easier to wrap your head around. But now you're trying to connect this timeline with the other timeline. 
But if you think about it, Sora is Sora, right? There's only one Sora that we know, right? So what's the only thing that separates the Sora we know from the other Soras? Well, that would be... Memory. The only thing that we and the Sora here share is... Memory. That's it. Takeshi tapped repeatedly on the area between his eyebrows and opened his mouth. Uh, really? If Sora's memory is here at the Mew, then the Sora we know is... Sora is in Himmel. You nodded. She touched Takeshi's shoulder lightly and traced her finger across his chest, then went back in the examination room. Left by himself, Takeshi started wandering aimlessly down the corridor. He turned right at a corner, then left, and continued walking his, with his hand on the wall. He ended up in front of IBF's large pool. And there was already someone there. Alright, well we need to take a break here. We're going over an hour. Um, I, I don't care if we go over an hour because the story is something I want to keep going with. But we do have to stop eventually. So we're going to stop here. Thank you for everything, my friends. I love you all so very much. And until next time, so long and take care. Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to comment on what you saw and what you would like to see next. I always love to hear your thoughts. Please be sure to like and subscribe for more. Also, please do not forget, you matter. You are brilliant and you are loved. And you should always remember to be true to yourself. Don't let the world tell you any different. Much love to you from your friendly feathered flightless bird. Till next time.